I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a lecture about the administrative law case Chevron versus NRDC from 1984 from the US Supreme Court. This is a case about what we call the bubble concept and judicial deference to agency interpretation. For my students, this is one of the most important cases in a whole, all of your administrative law course. In fact, it's arguably the most cited US Supreme Court case about administrative law. One of the most cited US Supreme Court cases about any area of law. It's very, very important. It kind of changed the landscape of judicial deference to agency interpretations. And in fact, we still, to this day, every term we get one or two, at least, uh, Chevron cases from the US Supreme Court. This is also in the casebook that I use for my statutory interpretation and regulation or legislation and regulation uh, class. So this is definitely one to know by name and know the bottom line and know a little bit about um, because it really matters not only for your class, but for practice. So let's look at what happened in this case. Here's your big takeaway, right? If you just, so you don't get lost in the details. This case introduced a doctrine now known as Chevron deference. And that's a two-part test that courts apply in deciding whether to defer to an agency's own interpretation of a statute. So here's our two parts. Number one, is the statute ambiguous or silent on the question? If so, then we go to step two and ask, is the agency interpretation reasonable? Now, that means that the court is not going to substitute its own policy uh, opinions or preferences. Um, the agency, if we get to step two, is probably going to win. Okay, let's keep going and talk about what happened. This case itself <clears throat> is about oil refineries, and Chevron in particular has a very large oil refinery in, um, in New Jersey along the I-95 corridor. So Congress amended the Clean Air Act in 1977 to require that in regions of the country that have not attained the established federal air quality standards, any construction or modification of a major stationary source of pollution that increases total emissions from that source must comply with a lot of new onerous or burdensome regulations. And by the way, that phrase stationary source is the crux of this case, that one phrase and what it means. Like, and so now the statute even has a definition section saying what stationary source means, but it's not that helpful. So here we go, section 111A, for purposes of this section, a ter the term stationary source means any building, structure, facility, or installation which emits or may emit any air pollutant. And so if you look at the pictures that I have included in my slides, um, let's go back for a moment, of refineries, right? There's a lot of smokestacks, right? And different pieces, installations or parts of a refinery. Refineries are these sprawling complexes that cover several acres. And the question is, is each pipe that has fumes coming out of it, its own um, stationary source, or is the whole compound the stationary source? And that's where we get to this graphic that I have borrowed from The Simpsons. Um, the issue here in this case is whether a stationary source refers to every individual installation in a facility or if the entire compound counts as one source. And this really matters. And the latter interpretation is what we call the bubble concept. And so it treats everything there as under one bubble. We don't mean a bubble in the sense of a dome. We mean an imaginary bubble where we're going to look at the aggregate emissions from the entire compound or the entire facility. And so if you think about it, and again, this is from the Simpsons movie. Um, if we're going to imagine this, so instead of counting each individual smokestack as a separate source, maybe we'll count the whole power plant, the whole refinery as one stationary source. Why does this matter so much? Well, um, let me explain. The Remember, the amendments, the new rules passed in 1977, uh, were really strict and, and in really infeasible for uh, 
an oil refinery to comply with. So, but it grandfathered in existing facilities. Remember it applied to new facilities. And so this meant that companies weren't going to do anything to upgrade or update their facility to replace things that were kind of half broken and inefficient and so forth. And the idea with using a bubble was that we might, uh, this imaginary bubble was that we would give companies an incentive to replace different components of their refinery or factory with ones that were newer and more up to date and the net amount of pollu air pollution being produced wouldn't increase right so they could uh, the whole as long as as a whole they weren't increasing so, so in other words if they open if they have a new smokestack emitting fumes they have to shut down an older one but that actually might have an advantage. And an, an economist might say, well, the new equipment you're putting in is probably going to be much more up-to-date and efficient than that old equipment, some of which is from before World War II. And that means that in theory, maybe we can refine the same amount of petroleum for less emissions or less pollution. So if the amount of petroleum we're producing stays the same, it actually might, the, the, this rule of holding the amount of pollution steady might actually reduce the overall amount of pollution. Of course, the demand continued to increase, but to meet the current demand, if you could make your facilities more efficient, then you might um, actually reduce the amount of pollution, um, but you certainly wouldn't make it any worse. And so if a facility adds or changes some equipment, like one piece of what you see in the picture here, and it emits more pollution, additional regulatory requirements won't apply as long as there are offsetting reductions elsewhere, right? You're going to mothball an, an older rundown or outdated piece of your facility so that overall emissions don't increase from the facility as a whole. And this actually encouraged expansion and upgrades of existing refineries and so forth. Now, um, remember that these amendments happened in 1977 during the Carter years. And during the Carter administration, the EPA defined source as any device in a manufacturing plant that emits pollution. And in other words, every single one of the items that you see in that picture of a refinery would be a source. And you couldn't put in anything new unless it basically breathed baby's breath, right? Like Garden of Eden air. And nobody could do that. So then Ronald Reagan won the White House in 1980, and in 1981, Reagan's EPA director, Ann Gorsuch, pictured here in the lavender outfit, um, adopted a new interpretation to grant permits to existing plants for new equipment that did not meet the standards, so long as the total emissions from the plant did not increase. Ann Gorsuch is Neil Gorsuch's mom. And in a twist of historical irony, Neil Gorsuch actually doesn't like Chevron deference. Okay, let's go back to our case. Now, the other party here is the National Resource Defense Council. They're an environmental advocacy group that litigates to um, uh, promote, to save the environment and to fight pollution and so forth. Note, by the way, in the caption of this case, we don't have an agency that's in the caption. We have an oil company versus an environmental group that are left. And here's why. The NRDC challenged the change and the DC Circuit Court of Appeals actually agreed with them. And so Chevron, who was an affected party, had gotten involved in the case and they brought the appeal, not the EPA. And then the Supreme Court reversed the DC Circuit Court of Appeals, ruling that the judiciary should defer to agencies inter interpretation of ambiguous statutes under the agency's purview. So remember, we're not talking about um, that any agency gets to interpret any statute in the US code. It's statutes that are related to that agency, that that agency has been entrusted by Congress with implementing or applying or enforcing. And we call this Chevron deference. Now, if you're looking for a zinger quote in your case to highlight here is where Justice Stevens, he wrote the majority opinion, lays out 
the Chevron test. And so I'm going to use his wording and then I'm going to kind of uh, paraphrase it or uh, boil it down for you. First, always, is the question whether Congress has directly spoken to the precise question at issue. If the intent of Congress is clear, that's the end of the matter. For the court, as well as the agency, must give effect to the unambiguously expressed intent of Congress. In other words, if the statute is clear, the agency just has to do what that clear, it clearly says. It doesn't, the agency doesn't have any discretion when the statute is express or explicit. If, however, the court determines Congress has not directly addressed the precise question at issue, the court does not simply impose its own construction on the statute. Rather, if the statute is silent or ambiguous with respect to the specific issue, and as an aside, it often is, the question for the court is whether the agency's answer is based on a permissible construction of the statute. So what is all that saying? Here's the first part, Chevron step one. Under the first step, a court asks if the statute is ambiguous or silent on the question. If not, if it's clear, unambiguous, then all we'd ask is, did the agency comply? Because they have to. And But if it is ambiguous or silent, then we assume Congress must have intended to delegate to the agency the authority to fill in the gaps, right? So um, that's, that's part of what agencies do. So Congress might have promulgated a general rule or law and then used left a few things unclear to give discretion to the agency to fill in the details. So then if it is ambiguous, we go to step two. Under the second step, if the statute is ambiguous or silent, courts ask if the agency's interpretation is reasonable. If so, courts defer to the agency instead of imposing their own view. In other words, we're not going to do statutory construction if we, get, if we decide that it's ambiguous, we're going to let the agency do it. Please note, this is an easy standard for agencies to meet. And so if we get to Chevron step two, the agency is gonna win more than 90% of the time, right? They would have to have something unreasonable that no one thinks is reasonable in order to lose at step two. Okay, here's a review question to make sure that you're paying attention. Um, what are the two steps of Chevron deference? Step one, whether the agency took a hard look at all the reasonable alternatives. Step two, whether the agency explained its reasons in the record. Or B, step one, whether the statute is ambiguous. Step two, whether the agency's interpretation is reasonable. Now, hopefully you know the answer to that. If not, you weren't paying attention and you need to go back and watch this video again. Okay, that concludes our lecture about the, the famous Chevron case. Please note that there's a lot of aftermath here. Other cases that applied this, struggled with it, reined it in, added another antecedent step, Chevron step zero and so forth, that we will look at subsequently in our course.